uh, God being almighty and God being our creator. And now we're going to move to the second article of the creed, which talks about who Jesus is and how important it is to realize that Jesus is fully God, 100%. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So we'll be focusing on that question. Uh, who do you say that I am uh, this morning and who is Jesus? Uh, we're glad to have you here. Uh, we're glad that you're able to continue to comply with our uh, masks and worship uh, just requirements and how we're staying safe. Uh, so during the sermon, feel free to, to remove those masks while we're singing and, and everything else. We ask that you please keep your masks on uh, as we gather together. Uh, with that, please stand for our opening hymn. and sisters, upon this, your confession, 
I have called servant to the word and announced the amazing grace of God unto each of you. And in his stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Believing truly in that grace and that forgiveness, we owe everything to grace. Our minds and our hearts now open to more clearly hear God's word and have it applied to our lives. Both readings for today, kind of supporting that foundation of God in Jesus being divine. Reading from Isaiah chapter 43. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I will send it to Babylon and bring down its fugitives, all the Babylonians, in the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, the Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland. To give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Yet you have not called upon me, O Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves for me, O Israel. You have not brought my sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor wearied you with demands for incense. You have not bought any fragrant calamus for me, or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices. But you have burdened me with your sins, and wearied me with your offenses. I, even I, am he who blots out transgressions for my own sake, and remembers your sins no more. This is the word of the Lord. Let's stand here in the house. You're welcome to stand at home worshiping with us as we honor and respect the words in the life of Jesus. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Matthew, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Now, some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up, take your mat, and go home. And the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to men. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Confessing our common faith together, helping us answer that question, Who is God? The Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, 
by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will not have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. I invite Eric Bry to come forward, our director of youth ministry. They get to hear a children's message from you back from vacation. They had to put up with me last week. Yeah. Good to see you, buddy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, raise your hand again if. You are a proud parent or grandparent. Wonderful. Okay. Kids, raise your hand if you are proud of your parent or grandparent. Okay. Good. All right. Wonderful. Well, uh, I have something here today, and I'll go back to the adults and ask the adults to raise your hand if you know what this is. Okay. Kids, take a look at this. Raise your hand if you know what this is. Okay, good. I'll call on one of the kids over here. What is this? It's a picture book. Picture book. Wonderful. Now, I'm going to put all the kids on a spot. Raise your hand if you knew this was a picture book. Okay. Yes, a picture book. Some of you may not have ever seen this before. Or you might see this as a large paperweight that sits on your coffee table. Or possibly... Uh, on a shelf somewhere, you're like, hey, cool, what's this book? And well, picture book has lots of pictures in it. This one in particular has pictures of my oldest son, Trevor, you know, when he was just a little baby, and all the different moments that were caught on film. Pictures. That's an antique. <laughs> it is. Today, how do we show pictures today? <laughs> right? Yeah. This might be more familiar to the kids, right? You want to see pictures of family. Right? You can hold lots of pictures here. You don't have to necessarily carry this around, take this to church with us. If we want to show how proud we are of our kids and the different activities, right? We just pull it up with a phone. Okay? Most of the time, that's probably what most people are doing when they're you know, showing pictures to one another on the phone. Okay? Showing up the proud moments that we have. But you know, sometimes the kids are maybe showing their proud moments of their parents and grandparents. Raise your hand, kids. Are you sharing proud moments of your parents? No? <laughs> Raise your hand if you're showing embarrassing moments of your parents. Yeah, that's right. That's what it is. Okay, but today, there's somebody else who is proud. You know, we're proud of our kids and grandkids, but God, do you think he was proud of his son, Jesus? Yeah. Yes, he was. And uh, we know this because the Bible tells us that there was this voice from heaven that said, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Then another part in the Gospel of Luke it says Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and men. So imagine the picture book that God has of Jesus, right? It'd be quite the picture book. Lots of reasons to be proud of Jesus. Followed his plan, did what he asked him to do, did it without much grumbling, right? 
Raise our hands if we do everything our parents say. Is that right? She said yes. So yeah. So God, his son Jesus, sent him here to earth as a proud dad to do things like miracles and to show us how we should live. For things like forgiveness and healing. But most importantly, to be that example. And God was proud of him. And the challenge today is for us to follow along and do what makes not only our parents or grandparents proud, but what makes God proud, our Heavenly Father. And to follow and try to strive to be like Jesus. You know, we can't be perfect, we can't be Him, but each day we can strive to be like Him and follow His example. That's the challenge. Amen. It's true because Wikipedia said so. 
Yet people have a variety of different opinions about this man from Galilee named Jesus who literally changed the world. If you went around and asked the question that Jesus asked Peter in the boat in the Gospels, who do you say that I am? The answers you would receive would be very different. Because people view Jesus differently. So when posed with the question of who do you say Jesus is, many people give many different answers. Like this, some might say Jesus was just a prophet, like those practicing Islam. See, others will say that he was a, a great moral teacher or a philosopher. He had a lot of good things to say. And more common these days in our current climate, people will say that Jesus was just a political activist or revolutionary. And some then also will just, just say that Jesus was a good person. He taught us how, how to love because love always wins. So yet Jesus... Jesus was so much more than any of these things. But see, people see Jesus for what they want to see. They model Christ after their own gods that they have made for themselves. They see Jesus as more of the God of good works, of knowledge, of politics, of reputation, and of good, fuzzy feelings. People want to turn Jesus into our moralistic, therapeutic deity who is here to serve my personal needs and agendas, who is here to, to help me feel spiritual and good about myself. So the doctrine of Christ has been stripped down, chiseled away, broken, and distorted by so many, which is why it's so important for us, the church, to confess the Apostles Nicene and the Athanasian creeds. Because these creeds are the result of so many people that lived long before us trying to figure out who Jesus is and got it wrong. Because this issue is not new to us. The early church struggled with the very ideas of who Jesus is. And therefore we have the creeds that keep us on track. Because these creeds were written to address those heresies or false teachings about this most influ influential historic figure from Galilee. See, early in the history of the church, there were councils and uh, debates, and there are people who were brought up on heresy charges about this man. Because they all were trying to get Jesus right. And some people argued that he was just 50% God and 50% man. Some said that he was all God and no humanity. It's my favorite explanation that he was just a spirit and he wore the human form as in a, quote, meat suit. And see, some said that Jesus was simply just a man, not divine. Some say that Jesus was not divine, and he was born that way. God adopted him and made him divine. See, it gets weedier and weedier trying to figure out who Jesus is. And all of these things, the historic church has deemed as heretical and false teachings about Jesus. So the question still stands, who do you say that I am? Well, we respond to this question, and just like we did moments ago, we confess. We confess that Jesus is full God and full man, 100% God, 100% man, fully divine and fully human. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. This is who Jesus is, and if you don't like it, then that's just too bad. Because this is what Scripture attests to. That Christ is fully divine. 
And we see evidence of this throughout his life by all of the, of the miracles he has done, by healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, and making the lame stand up and walk, and also raising the dead to life. We see it when he silences the storm from the boat and asserts himself as, as Lord over all creation. But these works that he does, these miracles, these wonders are not his greatest thing. They're not the most astonishing of all that he did. He does something even greater. He says something even more amazing than any of his parables or teachings. See, Jesus steps into a boat and crossed over and came to his own town. And some men brought him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. And when Jesus saw their faith that they had brought him to Jesus, he said to the man, Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. Wow. Wow, this, this man, the one who has been healing, raising, teaching, and feeding, and, 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 and helping to heal the, the walk, ones who can't walk, just forgave sins. Something that not only has temporary physical benefits, but something that has eternal, everlasting benefits. Your sins are forgiven. And at this time, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow, this man from Galilee is blaspheming. Or we're claiming to be God. And of course they're upset. To these Jewish leaders, for, for them, for someone else to claim to forgive sins means that they are claiming to be God himself. And as you know, it is written that you shall worship no other gods before me. There is one God and his name is Yahweh. This Jesus, this man is claiming to be forgiving sins. He is claiming to do the only thing that God can do, and in so doing, is claiming to be God himself. For that, we must kill him. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and walk? See, Jesus now knows that they desire to condemn him for claiming to be God. So he challenges them with a question. And he gives them two options, which is easier. To say, your sins are forgiven. Or to say, get up and walk. The logic of the question is that it's easier to say, your sins are forgiven. When you say your sins are forgiven, there is no outward proof of the matter. You don't have any physical evidence to show for it. You can't actually see that what you said came true. And the harder of the two is to say, get up and walk. Because there's a litmus test for that claim. When you say, get up and walk, that man is either going to get up and walk, or he's going to lay there with no change. So in order to, to show these men that Christ is who he says he is, he chooses to also do the harder thing. And Jesus says, but I know, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat." And go home. And then the man got up and went home. And when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to man. See, Christ has passed his own test, Christ has claimed his authority the authority that, 
not only to do that which is harder, to tell a man to get up and go home, but he has claimed his authority as the one who has come to forgive sins. He has claimed his authority as the Messiah, the Son of Man, the Son of God, God himself, Emmanuel, the Word becoming flesh. So who do you say that I am? Brothers and sisters, this question is so important. Because if Jesus is not God, then he is simply just a man. A man who has done nothing significant. A man who sure lived a good life, taught a lot of wisdom, and helped the poor and sick, but he's whisked away into the dredges of history. So he is no man worth putting your trust in, that's for sure. No man worth following. No man worth believing in. And certainly no man to put your hope in. See, we see this throughout history. Humans always let us down one way or another. Even the best of us fall. See, if Jesus is not God, his death on the cross is utterly meaningless. It doesn't matter. If Jesus is not God, you are still in your sins. If Jesus is not God, there is no eternal life. And if Jesus is not God, then there is only death. And if there is only death, there is no hope. Because if Jesus is not God, then that means that he was not raised from the dead. To so hear these words from the Apostle Paul. And if Christ has not been raised, brothers and sisters, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ or died in Christ, they are lost. Now hear this. Indeed, Christ has been raised from the dead. Christ has been raised from the dead. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Therefore, we follow him. It's because he has been raised from the dead that we know for certain that Jesus is full God. He has passed the litmus test. So we follow him. We follow Jesus, the Son of God, because when we follow Jesus, we are not following some moral philosopher. We are not following some political activist. We are not following some random self-proclaimed prophet. No, we are following the Son of God, the one who in his death has forgiven all sin like only God can do. In his resurrection, he was vindicated as true, 100% God, Lord of all creation, the one seated at the right hand of the Father. This is who we put in our trust and hope. And it's for this reason that we worship him, that we trust in him, and that we listen to and follow his word. So take heart, your faith is not in vain. Your faith is not futile and meaningless. Because Christ has risen. So we do. We worship Christ. We worship Christ because he is worthy of our praise. He has taken our sins away from us and has laid them on his shoulders. Christ in his death on the cross, although innocent, paid our price of death. And in his death, he was separated from his Father in order that we would not be separated. And then in his, in his resurrection, he once and for all proved that he was who he says he is, fully God. So, because he is fully God, we listen to Christ and his word. Because his word holds truth. And his 
word is spoken to us in love, for his words are full of grace and forgiveness. And even that thing, the law, which drags us down, is good. You listen to his word because it tells us who he is. Almighty God, seated at the right hand of the Father, but also loving and caring shepherd who feeds us. He leads us in the paths of righteousness, and he says, your sins are forgiven. See, we listen to his word because it is it's good for us, and it proclaims the promises of God. See, finally, we walk and follow Jesus. Because when you are following Jesus, you are following God in the flesh. Where does he lead you? He leads you to love your neighbor. He leads you and because you have Christ in you, he gives you the authority to forgive sins. And you are led to all people. You are led to them to, to tell them the good news of Jesus died and resurrected. But you are led to them to proclaim the forgiveness of their sins. See, you, are, you have his righteousness on you. You have Christ in you. See, you, you have the authority to do as Christ does. Say those words. I forgive you. Because when you say those words, they have the forgiveness of God. They have the forgiveness of Jesus, who being full God, came down from heaven and did many miraculous wonders, who, who paid your price of sin, who, who rose from the dead and has forgiven you and has clothed you with righteousness. Brothers and sisters, do not put your stock in political leaders or in news talking heads or in sports teams or philosophical minds who offer nothing but empty platitudes and promises, but instead follow Jesus. Because he has been raised from the dead, and because he has been raised from the dead, your faith is not in vain. Follow Jesus because your sins have been forgiven. Follow Jesus because he will lead you to everlasting life. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, if you, if you took your mask off, we ask you to put your mask back on as we sing our next song.
had a very sad and tragic um, loss in the congregation this past week. A, a young man at age 43, Mike Humes, who went to be with the Lord, um, leaving his wife and two very young children. Uh, since that occasion on Wednesday, we did have made the arrangements that there will be a memorial service this coming Thursday here at our Savior. So just for your awareness, for your prayers, and we encourage you to reach out uh, to Katie uh, and the kids as you have, have opportunity. It's a very sad uh, and tragic time for them. Received several uh, prayer requests through uh, Facebook, uh, through those watching us at home. Uh, real quick, are there any other prayer requests here that you would have? We don't provide cards for you. Anybody have a prayer request? Make sure I remember. Anyone in the house? Seeing that, I invite you to stand. Let's thank the Lord's throne of grace in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that unlike all other false images of you out there, you are a loving Father who has not left us guessing who you are, and not left us floundering around in how you feel about us, providing your own Son, the perfect image and reflection of you, God in the flesh with us in the person of Jesus. We thank you that we understand more fully today just why Jesus had to be divine. And next week, looking why he has to be human. This perfect plan of yours that secures our redemption and restores us to yourself. That original intent you have that we would live with you forever. We praise and magnify your glorious name. We'll give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. The steadfast love endures forever. Heavenly Father, our hearts do break for the Hughes family, for Katie, for Mike's uh, and Katie's children, John and Juliana, for Mike's parents and Katie's parents. Um, as we all look uh, to honor him and his life and commend him to your mercy and to your grace this week, dear and our Savior. Surround this precious family with your loving, fatherly arms, again recognizing if we're not for Jesus, we would have no hope. So Lord, as Jesus is the hope of Mike and Katie and their family, uh, we commend him to you and ask you to provide comfort that only you can. And I will give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Gracious God, a number of people we hold up for you today and pausing then for sharing them with you from our hearts. We pray this week for Bert Rose, one of our homebound members, uh, continuing to have failing health and going to hospice care at her home this past week. We lift up Harriet White, Kim Mester's mother, recovering from surgery and facing ongoing therapies and treatments. Pray for Grace Peckin Schneider, one of our college students, uh, who had successful nuts bar procedure this week in Iowa City to correct a uh, chest wall um, abnormality and pray that you would bring her home today or tomorrow. Pray for Tom Beardsley, a confirmed diagnosis of liver cancer. After testing, evaluating, and what if any treatment will be taken. Pray for Pastor Mark Kufal and his family, good friends of Marta and Mark Brooks. Uh, Pastor Mark, who's in need of a kidney transplant, and remembering that, which his congregation, several congregations that he served, is going through at this time. Pray for Brett Nicholson, cousin of Terry Cole, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Uh, for Paul, Becky, and Naomi, uh, friends of Janet Gilhouse, all who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. We pray for a uh, uh, for 10-year-old uh, Briasia, Terrell, from Davenport, uh, who's been missing for days, an ongoing search and recovery for Briasia. Pray for her, keep her safe, and, and bring her home, and provide your comforting uh, peace for her, for her family. We'll give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Thank you, great God, for the healthy, safe arrival on July 8th of a, of a 
a new granddaughter to uh, Paul and Phyllis Woodhouse, uh, to their children, Brian and Marissa. We thank you for little Birdley Natalia and ask that you would just surround her and her family and mommy with continuing healing and body and uh, just continue to protect this precious new little child of theirs and daughter and sister of ours in the faith, little Berkeley. Also, we pray uh, again in this um, difficult time, uh, particularly this week for small businesses, for people who are struggling to keep their businesses running and their livelihood um, going, those who are losing their jobs or being laid off and bring an end uh, to this pandemic time and restore normalcy uh, to people's lives, particularly this week, those small business owners and workers. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Amen. To your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with each of you all this. God is also with you. Thank you. Did the moment you share that peace, wave, however you feel comfortable with your family, or the folks around you, folks at home, share that peace with Christ, with one another from wherever it is you are worshiping from this morning. It's a joy for me now to be able to provide God's blessing and benediction upon us. We're going to our uh, final song, and then we'll just be seated for a few moments while you have prepared to be escorted out by our ushers in a couple brief announcements. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace.
that first uh, service and thought about through this week when Pastor Caleb and Kara and Nora were on vacation last week. It would have been last weekend that Pastor Caleb completed his first full year with us as our associate. I know I share, everyone shared with me how thankful you are. We are, but you are here, that you're a part of our life and a part of our staff, great partner in ministry. Second announcement would be again, we're really excited next week at the 10 o'clock service. You've probably seen the announcements an outdoor worship service. Several other churches have done this, uh, and we enjoy doing that around here, but that's going to be our first. Uh, here in a while for this year. 10 o'clock service. It will be live streamed at home. We're going to ask that you do sign up for worship in the 10 o'clock service just so we can know how many people to expect. We're going to be producing bulletins. We don't have the screen outside. We want to make sure we make enough. So sign up for worship 8 o'clock or 10 o'clock as well. Masks will be recommended, not required. Certainly welcome to bring them and would encourage you to do so most comfortable, but not required. Weather permitting, we, uh, we'll come back in here if it's 110 degrees or we have another tornado whipping through like almost last, last week. We'll come back in sanction. But looking forward to day, that day very much. Continue to sign up for communion as you have opportunity. Every week a few more people are kind of creeping out and coming back and, and uh, being a part of that. I encourage you to do that. Uh, the offering box is in the back of the sanctuary on the exit out there by two Tonys, two Tonys at the door uh, can show you where that where that box is. So again, great to be in worship together today. We enter worship.